Hello, this is Dr. Gardner. Today I'm going to talk to you about uh, some calculations involving solutions and solution concentrations. We'll be introduced to a concept of how we can calculate solution concentrations with a term called molarity. Now, there are many different types of calculations you can perform to determine the concentrations of solutions, but we won't be looking at the other units until later on in the course. So for this discussion, we're focusing on molarity. Now there are a few skills I'm assuming you've already developed from your coursework and that you've watched my previous tutorial videos on these. I'm expecting you've already watched the videos on calculating molar masses from your chemical formulas of your compounds. I also expect that you've already looked at how to calculate number of grams when given a mole quantity or uh, number of moles when given a gram quantity by using a molar mass conversion. I also assume you have memorized Avogadro's number and you understand how to use it from our previous tutorials. Now in this tutorial we're going to define a few concepts. We're going to look at the idea of solvents and solutes and solutions and when we have uh, solutions that have solutes that are molecular compounds versus ionic compounds. We'll have a short introduction in this tutorial on that. We'll look at that in greater detail in future tutorials. Uh, we'll also look at the physical techniques you'd use in the laboratory to prepare a solution using what we call volumetric glassware. Uh, we're going to then define what molarity is, look at molarity concentrations. Please note we're using a capital M for the units for molarity. We'll use those molarity uh, values for concentrations and in calculations in this uh, chapter and so we'll see how to calculate molarities of solutions that we prepare. We'll determine as we deliver a volume of those solutions how many volumes or, or how many moles or how many grams of the solute might you be delivering. We'll also determine how to calculate the volume you should use if you have a certain quantity you want to deliver. So we'll be looking at those types of calculations in this tutorial. Now the part two of the solution calculations tutorials which will be uh, uh, posted after this one, we'll be looking at dilutions of solutions. So I don't actually talk about dilutions in this tutorial. If you're looking for those uh, types of discussions, that's in part two. Okay, so first of all, let's define what a solution is. Now, when I have a solution, I'm going to be dealing with a homogeneous mixture. Now, remember, that means we have a very uniform mixture. In fact, when we're talking about solutions, usually our mixtures are mixed down to very small levels, down to um, molecules, atoms, ions, very uniform throughout the whole solution. Uh, with respect to... <coughs> the types of solutions we might look at, there's at least two or more components. So we may have a solvent and we may have one or more solutes present in this mixture when I'm talking about my solutions. Now let's talk about this homogeneous type of mixture we're calling a solution, the types of components we might have and the terms we'll use to define those. Now usually what we have present as this one of the smaller amounts of one of the components of the mixture we would call our solutes. Uh, this is the substance that we are going to dissolve when we make the solution. So in your kitchen, if you dissolve uh, sodium chloride salt from your salt shaker or sugar from your pantry in water, well, one of the solutes would be either the sodium chloride or would be the sugar that you're dissolving. It's what's being dissolved by what we're going to define as our solvent nest. Uh, they're usually present in smaller quantities than the other component of our solution, which we call the solvent. Now, I can have several different solutes present. There's no reason why you couldn't dissolve both sugar and sodium chloride from a salt shaker in your solution, so I can't have multiple solutes. Uh, many of the calculations will start you with looking at we'll only have one solute at a time but then we'll start to look at more complex types of calculations in the future where there's multiple solutes. Now my solvent is a substance that's doing the dissolving so if I'm dissolving sugar or salt with water uh, the water is doing the dissolving process here it's usually present in the largest amount out of the two components <clears throat> I like to often ask that you define solutions solutes and solvents on our second test in the course so make sure you know the definitions for these and if we look at a few types of solutions I want you to note that when we define solutions as a homogeneous mixture we didn't say that had to always be in the liquid state we're maybe very common with uh, water-based solutions in our society and on planet Earth because there's so much water on the planet. Uh, but we can have homogeneous mixtures down to these very small levels of molecules, atoms, or ions in other states of matter other than just the liquid state. So let's look at a few different types of solutions and the types of solvents present and the solutes present in these types of solutions. Let's just say we're looking at a soft drink. Now that's going to be a solution in the liquid state. 
Now with a soft drink, the major component that's dissolving all of the other components is going to be the solvent. That's the water content in the soda pop. Your solutes would be uh, the sugar present in the soda pop or the artificial sweetener. Or uh, you also have carbon dioxide, right, as your carbonation in there. That carbon dioxide is forming some carbonic acid. Uh, some of your colas can have some phosphoric acid in there. You can have flavorings and colorings present and other types of solutes present. So this is an abbreviated list of the solutes. Uh, but this would be an example of a very common type of liquid-based solution that you deal with in your everyday life. Now, we can have other mixtures that are homogeneous, right, that are solutions. We can define <coughs> the air around us as fairly uniform if we can consider it as uh, maybe the two top corners of the classroom you're in and you think about the mixture of gases there, they're fairly uniform. And so I can think about air uh, being in the gas state, but we can also define it as a solution because it meets our definition of a homogeneous mixture depending on exactly where we're looking with respect to the air and how large of a sample that we're studying. If I fill up a container with air and I isolate that, we can definitely argue it's fairly homogeneous. Now the major component in air, about 78%, is nitrogen gas. Okay, so we could define that as a major component as our solvent for the air. And then our solutes would be all the other gases present in smaller quantities. So we could have oxygen gas, argon gas, some of the other uh, noble gases in small quantities. Uh, you can have some methane, you have uh, carbon dioxide gas, you have water vapor, and any other gases present, including any pollutants. We could include those as solutes. Uh, but there's an example of a gas-based solution. Now, if we talk about solid-based solutions, now many of our solid-based solutions, when we prepare them, we might melt them and form a liquid and then allow them to cool back down to room temperature and we solidify them once they have a homogeneous mixture. But a very common solid-state uh, type of solution would be alloys. Uh, we can think about soft solder that's used uh, where the major component might be lead as a solvent and you could have tin or other metals present with their low melting points as the solutes. And so that would be an example of a solid-state solution. So we have liquid gas and solid state solutions. Really, we just have to meet the definition that we have a very uniform homogeneous mixture of two or more substances mixed together. And then we can start to define my solutes and my solvents just as we have here. Now, even though I've told you that we can have solutions in the gas and the solid state, we will be looking at a lot of liquid state solutions uh, in our uh, upcoming chapters and in the lab. Uh, we will be looking at gas laws later in the course, so then we'll come back to looking at gas-based solutions. So don't forget that I can have different states of matter for the solutions I'm looking at. Now let's discuss when we have solutions involving our most common solvent. In fact, uh, you may have heard water called a universal solvent. Now the reason that water is called a universal solvent is because it's a very polar molecule and when we're dealing with liquid water it's very good at dissolving other polar molecules or dissolving soluble ionic compounds dissolving the ions present in those substances and so it can dissolve a lot of different materials uh, but it doesn't truly dissolve everything even though we sometimes refer to it as universal solvent it's not very good at dissolving nonpolar um, molecules for example let's say with hydrocarbons like in gasoline when we're dealing with carbon and hydrogen based compounds that are present in the mixture of gasoline gasoline is very non polar. Um, most of the molecules have very little polarity to them. That means the electrons are distributed fairly equally throughout the entire molecule. And so as we're looking at those, they don't dissolve well in a polar solvent like water. So uh, we would end up with layering uh, gasoline and water, and they would be separated based on density. The gasoline is less dense as a mixture and it ends up above the water in our density columns we talked about earlier in the course. Now, However, polar molecules, like sugar molecules, for example, or ionic compounds are soluble, like uh, sodium salts, like sodium chloride or table salt, they dissolve very readily in the polar water molecules in the liquid state. And so when we're referring to water-based solutions in the course, we often will add a phase label. We'll show after the formula for the compound a, a AQM brackets, meaning we have an aqueous-based solution, so we have a water-based solution that we're dealing with. And so whenever I'm discussing water-based solutions, rather than having to write all the water molecules out surrounding my solutes, we often will just show that phase label AQ to indicate that we have an aqueous-based solution or a water-based solution. 
Now, polar and molecular compounds can dissolve in water. Let's imagine we have a simple monosaccharide, a simple type of sugar with a single sugar ring in the structure when we're looking at it. Uh, let's consider a glucose, which you can also call blood sugar. Uh, your glucose is a very simple sugar. When it dissolves in water, we could have uh, little crystals of, of sugars that I'm talking about. You're used to seeing, let's say, sucrose, which actually has a glucose and fructose unit in it. Uh, but when I'm looking at glucose, uh, in the solid state, you're going to have your polar uh, glucose molecules, sugar molecules in close proximity being attracted to one another due to their polarity. When I dissolve this, the glucose or any other type of sugar we might want to look at into water, what happens are the water molecules will surround each of my glucose molecules and separate them. And so now I get individual glucose molecules separated by water molecules. Now I want you to note that when we dissolved a polar molecular compound, the formula that we would write for that, in this case, uh, we have C6H12O6 for the uh, formula for glucose, isn't broken up. We didn't break up the carbons, we didn't break up the hydrogens, we didn't break up the oxygens. There were no chemical bonds broken. Uh, there were no covalent bonds broken. We were basically just pulling apart the electrostatic static attractions, the, the charge attractions from the partial polar character of these polar molecules. We were pulling those apart and replacing them with interactions with the polar water molecules. But I did not change the identity of my simplest unit of this compound, which was the molecule that we had. So I can very readily get these molecules back. So if we consider this process of dissolving a solute, we this is a physical change. We did not destroy the identity of our solutes with our molecular compounds. We could get these molecules back very readily by removing the water content from this mixture. Now let's consider when an ionic compound dissolves. When an ionic compound dissolves, <coughs> the formula units that we're used to looking at doesn't stay intact. So this is different. Our molecular compounds, the formula units we looked at with our molecular compounds, stayed intact when we dissolve those polar molecules. However, with an ionic compound, if I have a soluble ionic compound, and we'll be learning solubility rules coming up in the next chapter, but when I have a soluble ionic compound, we can put the phase label as an S to indicate that we have the solid state when I dissolve that in water. So let's take, a, say I take some table salt, sodium chloride from a salt shaker, put that in water, we can show water molecules above the arrow here to indicate that I'm now surrounding the ions by those polar water molecules. <coughs> and we can actually pull the cations and the anions apart from their ionic lattice from the original formulas that we were looking at. That's just the simplest empirical formula. We actually have a more complex uh, set of charge attractions throughout the bulk ionic compound crystal but the water molecules can pull these apart. We weren't actually breaking any covalent bonds. We weren't pulling apart atoms from a molecule. In these ionic compounds, we just had complete transfer of electrons, and we had metals that had formed cations by losing one or more electrons. We have nonmetals that have gained electron, one or more electrons to form an anion. Uh, we can stabilize those as they dissociate, is what we call this, and we surround them by water molecules. Now, to indicate this process, after the arrow, we show the cations and the anions separated from one another, and then we show their phase label, that we have an aqueous-based solution. We have a water-based solution with the AQ in our brackets for our phase label. And so we have water molecules surrounding each of the cations and each of the anions. Now the orientation of the water molecule is not the same for each type of ion. The cations are surrounded by the slightly negative end of a water molecule by the oxygens, and your chloride is surrounded by the slightly positive end of the water molecules by the hydrogens. So if we look at this process, we have a water molecule shown. This arrow with the plus sign is what we call a molecular dipole. The head of the arrow is the end of the molecule where there's a little bit more negative character. We say that it's uh, electron cloud, the distribution of electrons that we'll discuss more in the course later in that semester, uh, is close to where the electrons are in the oxygen here, and then the hydrogen atoms are more electropositive with less electron density is what we would say. So I showed that and the arrow is positive. Now there are, they aren't ions. The electrons are just not distributed equally throughout the entire molecule. And we'll learn how to predict that later on in the course. Uh, but right now we can just remember the hydrogens are slightly positive. Now it's not a positive charge like a cation. So I'm going to use this little lowercase Greek letter delta 
but with a positive sign, so it's partially positive, but not a cation. The other end by the oxygen, I'm going to show the lowercase Greek letter delta with a negative sign, so it's slightly negative on the end of the molecule. And so we can orient these sides of the polar molecule towards our cations and anions to maximize this attraction due to these partial charges. So my cations are surrounded by the oxygens in my water molecules. The anions are surrounded by the hydrogens in my water molecules. Now this happens in a three-dimensional uh, shape, so I'm kind of seeing a cross-section here. We actually have water molecules above and below these ions in what we call a hydration sphere or a solvation sphere. When I talk about a hydration sphere, that's your water molecules surrounding your ions. And when I talk about a solvation sphere, I could be talking about other types of solvents that could be surrounding your ions in the liquid state, for example. Uh, so solvation sphere is just a little broader term. Hydration sphere is specifically talking about water surrounding a, a solute, in this case surrounding my ions. So just notice that the cations and the anions orient water around them slightly differently in order to stabilize them. So just remember, when you have water, we can say that this is a hydration process. When we talk about other solvents, we can talk about it as a solvation process. But in either case, ionic compounds tend to dissociate in polar solvents like water, and the ions are separated from one another. We replace the charge attractions between the cations and the anions uh, with charge attractions to the solvent to help stabilize them as they form the mixture in the solution. Now realize that when we dissolve compounds, this is not a chemical change. We didn't destroy the identity of the solute uh, compounds. In fact, uh, when we're looking at this, I could separate out my solutes very readily by using the physical differences, let's say in boiling point between the solvent for water, let's say, and my solutes, higher boiling points for sugars or ionic compounds like sodium chloride. Okay. So if I wanted to remove uh, my original compound, the sugar or let's say a salt, I could go ahead and evaporate my water off or boil my water till it goes to the gas state and leave behind the solid. Okay, so that's just a physical change. So when I dissolve solutes and solvents, those are physical changes. When I separate my solutes from a solvent by, by a different physical method, such as this, that's still a physical change. So remember, you can go ahead and remove sugar very readily from sweet beverages by allowing the water to be boiled off or evaporate off. In fact, if you've ever had a shaken up, uh, shaken up soda pop that has uh, been opened, and so you end up with the uh, carbon dioxide and the carbonation in that supersaturated solution, a solution that has more than is the stable amount of carbon dioxide dissolved in it, you can end up having your soda pop spraying uh, throughout the room and you can end up with droplets of it being left behind that have a solution that has sugar and other solutes present in your solvent of water. If your water evaporates off, you can leave that sugar behind and we've all enjoyed when we have those sticky little spots all over our kitchen or our house where that may have happened and so we are very careful not to leave sugar behind from that solution by allowing uh, soda pop to be spilled or to spray out of a shaken up uh, container. But whenever I remove the sugar molecules, I don't have to recombine the carbon, hydrogens, and oxygens of the sugar. They were still present as those molecular units. They were just mixed within the water molecules. It would, in fact, if they had been separated, why would the carbon and hydrogen and oxygen recombine in the original uh, formula of that sugar molecule? It wouldn't. There was no chemical change. We still had all the original covalent bonds, the shared electrons between the nonmetals, the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygens. We merely physically separated out uh, those molecules to leave them behind while we separated out the solvent by the evaporation physical process. So just remember, solutions being formed or separating out components of solutions, that's all physical changes. Okay. Now molecular compounds Realize, unlike ionic compounds, they don't ionize the same way. Uh, they don't, sorry, they don't uh, dissociate the same way as ionic compounds. They don't dissociate into separate ions. Uh, molecular compounds will usually, in most cases, just stay those simplest molecular units that we were looking at. And if we want to find out what type of molecule we have, well, we have to use the techniques we learned in our previous tutorials using... Uh, finding empirical formulas as well as molecular formulas. But once I know the molecular formula, that formula for that molecule is maintained when I form solutions or I separate them from solutions. Now realize there are some molecular compounds, let's say like weak acids, that can 
go through a process called ionization. They can actually form some ions in water, uh, but they're not going through the same process of dissociation that our ionic compounds do. So we'll talk more about ionization uh, of acids later on in the course. Now realize ionic compounds dissolve readily. Polar molecular compounds dissolve readily, uh, but neutral atoms are usually have a lower solubility. If I talk about neutral uh, gas-based atoms or molecules trying to bubble them in water, they will dissolve slightly, but they don't dissolve to such a large extent as, let's say, ionic compounds like sodium chloride or polar molecules like sugars would dissolve. In fact, when you heat up solids, they tend to become more soluble in water. Uh, as you're making solutions. Whereas if you heat up a solution with gases in it, you actually cause the gas to be less soluble. If you really want to understand uh, the thermodynamics of that process, you'll want to take some more advanced chemistry courses with us later. Okay, so let's talk about uh, concentration of solutes in my solutions with respect to the solvent. Now when I'm talking about concentration of solutions, uh, the most common unit we'll begin working with you in lab will be molarities. We'll use a capital M to indicate molarity. You should never use a lowercase m. There's multiple other units I might confuse lowercase m's with. For example, meters or a, another concentration unit that we will call molality later. So I don't want to confuse a lowercase m here with the lowercase m for molality. So I'm going to use a capital M whenever I want to talk about molarity. Now molarity is defined. This is a very important definition. I may ask you to uh, give me this definition on a test. But molarity is the moles of solute that I have in every liter of my solution mixture. Now please note this isn't liters of solvent, it's liters of the solution mixture. So it's moles of solute per liter of the solution mixture that I have when I prepare a solution of molarity. So if I go to the lab and I see, let's say I have 6 capital M HCl, 6 molarity hydrochloric acid, that would indicate that I have 6 moles of the solute, which is the hydrochloric acid, for every liter of the solution that I have. And that would be a fairly high concentration of hydrochloric acid. If I had a solution that was 0 0.1 molarity, with just a 0 0.1 a capital M shown of hydrochloric acid, that concentration would be much less. That would mean I have 0 0.1 moles of the solute, the hydrochloric acid, for every liter of solution. So the larger your number is before molarity, the more moles of the solute I have per liter of solution. So please remember that I can write molarity with a capital M or I can bring the units out and say that's how many moles of solute per every liter of solution when I'm performing calculations. So I can use moles per liter as a unit conversion factor when I have molarities given. So we're going to practice doing this here in a minute. So let's say we have a solution that we prepared that is one liter and we have prepared a 1.00 molarity of the solution using sodium chloride. Let's talk about how we could prepare this solution. First of all, if I have one liter of the solution and it's 1.00 molarity, this is a fairly simple scenario. That means in that one liter, I only have one mole of the solute in that one liter of that solution. So since I'm dealing with sodium chloride, I need to find out how much sodium chloride I should use. And in the laboratory, we're usually going to weigh out a gram quantity of sodium chloride. Okay, so my molecular mass for sodium chloride will be needed in order to convert my number of moles to grams. And so I need to write the formula for my solute, so NaCl for sodium chloride. Then I would want to calculate my molar mass for sodium chloride. So I go to the periodic table, I find uh, the mass per sodium or chlorine atom. They're present as ions, of course. I add up those masses. That'll give me a value of 58.44 atomic mass units per formula unit. Or if I have a molar quantity, we'll have 58.44 grams per mole. Okay. Now in this case, realize since we want to look at a solution that is one molarity, well then I would have one mole of solute for every one liter of solution. So I'm going to go ahead and write down the molarity that I was given. One molarity is, can also be written as 1.00 moles of sodium chloride, the solute, per 1.00 liters of the solution mixture. So I pulled the units out so I can do some calculations and cancel units. I'm going to go ahead and multiply by the molar mass that we calculated in grams per mole. Now I'm converting the mole quantity here to grams by multiplying by the molar mass. That's going to give me a value of 58.44 grams of sodium chloride that I'd have to use to prepare 1.00 liter of this solution. So whenever I have a one molarity solution that I have one liter of, then the number of grams I need to dissolve is identical to my molar mass. Now there'll be many cases where I won't have this exact number of grams because I may end up with a solution that has 
a different number of moles than one or a different volume of solution other than one liter. In those cases, I'll have to correct for how many grams to prepare that amount of solution at that molarity value. We'll practice those in a minute. But let's talk about how we would actually prepare this solution in the laboratory. So we've done a calculation. We know how many grams of sodium chloride to dissolve and put in that one liter of solution. But how do you actually do this in the lab? Okay. In the laboratory, we'd go ahead and find our sodium chloride. And so here's a reagent bottle of sodium chloride. I want you to notice that if I look closely at the bottle, many reagent bottles will have a formula weight, also known as a uh, molar mass, as a synonym, or a formula mass. And here it's just what we calculated, right? 58.44 grams per mole. They didn't show units because if we're looking at a single formula, that'd be in atomic mass units. If we're talking about a mole quantity, that's grams per mole. So if you're lucky enough, the bottle will remind you, and I'd always double check that you have the same molar mass from your calculation as on the bottle. You either would have, if you have a different value, either you miscalculated the molar mass, or maybe the substance isn't the same as what you thought you were measuring. Uh, sometimes there can be waters of hydration in there, so there can be some water content. In those cases, the molar mass would be different, and that would warn you that you had to account for that. Now, what I want to do then is get a weighing boat. Now, in the lab, uh, you can have weighing paper or weighing boat sometimes, or your instructors may have you weigh into other containers like beakers. What I will usually do is tear whatever container I'm going to use. Now, to tear a container, we can go ahead and record the mass of the empty container. Uh, with respect to what you can do with some of our scales is sometimes you can zero uh, the mass of your container, but it's always recommended you might want to write down the mass of the container in case you want to take some measurements with that container later. Uh, once you have uh, either teared or zeroed out the mass of your weighing boat, we're going to go ahead and put 58.44 grams of our sodium chloride in there. I'll use a microspatula usually to measure out the quantity. And then I record in my notebook exactly what I weighed out. So here I weighed out 58.446 grams. I just record exactly what I weighed out. Uh, usually that the very last digit here, <coughs> that are thousandths of a gram, can be off by a little bit as long as I record exactly what I used. Uh, the weighing scales that we have in our lab, we have to determine masses, we can close a lid on them to prevent fluctuation from air currents in the room, which tends to affect this last digit. That's our last significant figure, so there's usually a little bit of error in that digit. Now, once I've weighed out the correct amount of sodium chloride, we need to decide what container to use to measure our volume. Here I wanted to prepare uh, one mole of the solute, that's the 58.44 grams of sodium chloride, in one liter of solvent, but I need to make sure that the mixture combined volume is one liter. So I can't just add one liter of water to this because once I mix the water with the sodium chloride, you can actually have a different volume than even the solid and the liquid would have separately. When your solute dissolves in water, you can end up with either larger or smaller volumes. Now it may be surprising that you could end up with smaller volumes, but the solute particles with the solvent particles can sometimes pack closer together than the than the pure substances. So the volume can change. Sometimes you end up with a larger volume though. So I really can't tell that in advance unless I've uh, looked up that information or studied this type of solution in the past. So I need to find some glassware that will help me measure the mixture volume at one liter. So what we can do in our laboratories is we can find a volumetric flask. Now volumetric flasks have a little etched line on the neck of the flask which has been calibrated to contain the volume that is listed down here on the flask. You'll notice here are some common sizes of volumetric flasks that we have at the stockroom. And we have 1,000 milliliters, which is one liter, 500 milliliters, which is half a liter, 250 milliliters, which is a quarter of a liter, uh, 100 milliliters, a tenth of a liter, or uh, 50 milliliters, a twentieth of a liter. And there's, there's a variety of other sizes. These are just some common sizes we work with. So since I want to prepare a one liter solution, I want to pick out the 1,000 milliliter volumetric flask. I made sure I also got a ground glass stopper that I'll be using in a moment with it. Now that volumetric flask, what I'll be doing with it, to prepare my solution, I make sure I have the right size, 1,000 milliliters. If I look carefully at it, there's a TC here. That means to contain 1,000 milliliters, it was calibrated at probably just a few degrees below your room temperature, about 20 degrees Celsius, because the volume of the glassware can change. I would never want to heat volumetric glassware in an oven or on a hot plate, because it can actually distort the glass and change this calibrated volume. So I'm very careful not to ever put it on a hot plate or put it in an oven. Now. 
it also shows you there's an error here of about 0.3 milliliters, so a little less than a third of a milliliter. That is a very small error compared to the size of this flask of 1,000 milliliters, so it's a better choice than using a graduated cylinder, which would have a higher error than this. Uh, it's also a class A piece of glassware. The A glassware has less error than class B or C glassware, so there's quite a bit of useful information here. Now once I have my 1000 milliliter flask, I'm here using a glass stopper. Now students sometimes will incorrectly put glass stoppers down on their countertops or bench tops, which can contaminate the glass stopper and could then contaminate your volumetric flask and the solution that we're going to make in it. So whenever you're handling a glass stopper, you should go ahead and hold the glass stopper between your fingers here. And then I hold it there while I'm handling my glass or so I never set it down, I never contaminate the glass stopper. So here's an example. I can have my glass stopper between my fingers. I can go ahead and hold on to my volumetric flask and handle it whenever I'm uh, preparing solutions or pouring solutions. You notice here I can hold that glass stopper while I'm tipping my volumetric flask if I were to pour a solution out of it later on today. Now, I need to put my solute in my volumetric flask. So here you notice I'm still holding the glass stopper, not setting it down. I don't want to contaminate anything. I took my weighing boat from the scale, and I'm pouring my sodium chloride into my volumetric flask. If I need to, I can use a micro spatula to help transfer that solid, but I'm very careful not to spill any of the sodium chloride because if I lose any of the sodium chloride, the concentration of my solution I'm preparing would be off. In fact, once I finish pouring all of this solid ionic compound into my volumetric flask, there may be a few granules left behind that uh, due to static electricity uh, may be sticking to the surfaces of the weighing boat and so I can go ahead and use a distilled water bottle and I normally in the lab if we mention that you're using water to prepare a solution we normally mean deionized water or distilled water or reverse osmosis water all different samples of water basically that have been deionized they have most of the ions removed from them so it's a very pure water sample so this deionized water that I'm using I'm spraying onto the weigh boat to rinse off any more of my solute so I'm trying to quantify transfer transfer it, meaning I'm trying to transfer all of the ionic compound to my flask. Now when I'm rinsing my weigh boat, I'm careful not to transfer more water than my container will hold below that edge line. What I will usually do with a large container like this is go ahead and get more deionized or distilled water and fill up the container about halfway with my sodium chloride in the bottom and then I will tend to swirl my container to dissolve the sodium chloride. I try to dissolve as much sodium chloride as I can in this case by swirling the container and I can gradually keep adding water maybe up to three quarters of the volume and keep swirling my container. Now I want to dissolve as much solute as possible because as I said before as the solute dissolves in the solvent the water we can end up with a, having a volume change. So I want to minimize that by dissolving as much sodium chloride uh, early on in the process before I fill my container. Plus it's much harder to swirl and mix the solvent with the solute once you get into the neck of the container so it's good to gradually add solvent as we're dissolving the solute. Now once I've dissolved the majority of my solute I'm going to go ahead and add my some more distilled water. I'm using the squirt bottle to give myself a little more control here or I could use a, a little pipette to add water until the bottom of my meniscus is here at the etched line on the volumetric flask. Now at that point, I'll go ahead and get what we call parafilm. This is a little bit like plastic wrap in your kitchen, but it's a little stretchier. Uh, the parafilm, you can go ahead and seal uh, the neck of the flask. So I put the glass stopper back in. I'm stretching the parafilm around uh, the stopper on the volumetric flask. Once I've sealed that up nice and tight, what we will do is put our thumb so we'll hold the nest, neck of the flask, we'll put our thumb over uh, the glass stopper and make sure it's firmly in place, and then we will in invert about 10 times to finish mixing any of the last uh, solvent that I added to the mixture so we have a uniform solution where the solute and the solvent are homogeneously mixed throughout. If you forget to do this inversion, we may have had a little bit lower solute concentration in the neck where we added the last little bit of water, and this helps confirm that since we have a uniform solution after inverting about 10 times that we'll have the same amount of solute per volume of solvent uh, from the top of the flask versus the bottom of the flask. Now if I was to store the solution for a long period of time, so more than maybe my lab period, I often would transfer it to another container and label that container with respect to the molarity concentration of 1.00 molarity in this case because I had one mole of sodium chloride for one liter of solution. 
and I would put down the date it was prepared on my container as well as uh, the name or the initials of the person who prepared it and that way we can track down uh, who prepared the solution and when it was prepared and we know if it perhaps could decompose over time how long it may be fresh for. Uh, a lot of times if you're keeping track of this carefully in a, a notebook that has numbered pages will also indicate uh, your initials may be on there and the notebook number whether it's your first second third or whatever notebook you're prepared and the page number so that way we can track down when you first prepared the solution and any mass information when you wait out the solute that you might have recorded so that's the proper technique for preparing your solutions and keeping track of that information now let's try some more complicated solutions what aren't that aren't merely one molarity in a one liter solution so let's say that we are interested in calculating the molarity of a solution when I'm told that I take 32.1 grams of potassium nitrate and I'm putting that number of grams of potassium nitrate as my solute in my solvent water and I'm adding a solvent to my solute that I prepare 500 milliliters of solution. So I'd use probably a 500 milliliter volumetric flask for this process. Now the first thing we need to do in this case is calculate uh, the molar mass or the molecular mass of potassium nitrate. That's because I need to convert from grams of potassium nitrate to moles of potassium nitrate. So first of all I'm going to write the formula from the name. So potassium nitrate is the formula KNO3, one potassium cation to every nitrate anion. I'm going to go ahead and calculate my molar mass for potassium nitrate. I set up a table and do that. I won't spend much time here since we've done that in previous tutorials. But I prepare my uh, solution with potassium nitrate that has a molar mass of 101.11 atomic mass units per formula unit. Or if I have a mole of potassium nitrate, that would be 101.11 grams uh, per mole of potassium nitrate. Now I use less than a full mole here. right? I use 32.1 grams. Now, to calculate my molarity, I need to remember that that capital M, or that molarity concentration unit, is going to be my moles of solute, that's the potassium nitrate moles, divided by the liters of the solution mixture. Okay, so I know I took 32.1 grams of potassium nitrate in 500 milliliters. I need to convert my units of grams for mass and my units of volume milliliters to moles per liter. So I need to convert the grams to moles and the milliliters to liters. So first of all, I'm going to convert my grams to moles by dividing by molar mass. So I divide by 101.11 grams of potassium nitrate for every one mole of potassium nitrate. That will now give me moles of potassium nitrate for 500 milliliters. Now I'm going to convert my milliliters to liters. So there's 1,000 milliliters for every one liter. You'll notice the milliliter units will cancel. And now I'll get moles of solute per liter of the solution mixture. That's the correct units for molarity. So I can write down my molarity as 0 0.635 molarity of potassium nitrate. Okay. So that's how we can calculate molarity of any solution. As long as you can convert to moles of your solute, divide that by the liters of the solution mixture, you'll have the molarity of the end solution. Now let's say we want to know how much of our solute we've delivered when I take a sample from a molarity solution. Let's say we have a 0.1 molarity solution of potassium chloride and we deliver, let's say, 250 milliliters of this solution. And I want to know when I'm delivering that to chemical reaction how many moles of the solute did we use for that chemical reaction. Now here's my process of doing this calculation. I realize since I'm giving milliliters of the solution, if I'm going to play nicely with the units of molarity, which is moles of solute per liter of solution, I'm going to convert that milliliters to liters. There's a thousand milliliters per one liter. Then once I have the liters of my solution, if I multiply that by my molarity, remember my molarity has units of moles per liter, the liters will cancel. That'll give me the moles of the solute that I've used. If I wanted to go to grams, we could then multiply by the molar mass. Okay, but first of all, let's find how many moles of solute we used in this case. So I had 250 milliliters of my solution. I can convert that to liters. So I divide by 1,000 milliliters per liter. Now I have my number of liters. If I multiply by my molarity, I'm going to pull my units out for molarity. Remember, molarity is moles of solute potassium chloride per liter of solution. So I have 0 0.100 moles of potassium chloride for every one liter of solution. You notice I didn't need to use a molar mass to get to this because units of molarity is already in moles per liter. If I multiply my molarity, which is merely 0.11, sorry, 0 0.100 moles of potassium chloride for every one liter, the liters will cancel. The milliliters already canceled here. We'll end up with moles of potassium chloride I've delivered with this quantity of solvent. So I've delivered 0 0.0250 moles of potassium chloride. Now, if I want to know how many grams of solute are in that volume, 
Well, then I can take the moles of solute we just calculated, multiply by the molar mass to get the grams of solute. So if I take 0 0.0250 moles of potassium chloride and multiply by the molar mass for potassium chloride, which is 74.55 grams of potassium chloride for every one mole, we end up with 1.86 grams. So I've delivered 0 0.0250 moles of potassium chloride with this quarter of a liter, and I've delivered 1.86 grams of potassium chloride to my reaction. Now the next question I want to ask you is how many moles of ions are present in that volume of solution? Now to think about this, I do have an ionic compound, potassium chloride. It's soluble, so when it dissolves in water, it dissociates to form one potassium cation and one chloride ion for every formula unit. Or if I had a mole of potassium chloride formula units, I'd end up with two moles of ions. One mole of cations and one mole of anions. So I can set up this calculation and say I have 0 0.0250 moles of potassium chloride and there's going to be two moles of ions for every one mole of the formula. That's because I end up with potassium and chloride ions. Two ions for every formula unit. Now some other ionic compounds can have more than two ions in the formula, so you have to correct for that for your conversion factor here each time by looking at how many ions are in the formula. So I just end up with twice the number of moles of ions, 0 0.0500 moles of ions. The reason we care about this is later on in the course we'll calculate what are called colligative properties, which relate to the number of particles in solution. And ionic compounds can deliver more than one particle per formula unit. Here we're delivering about twice the number of particles for every formula unit. And so that could affect properties like boiling points, melting points, vapor pressure for calculations uh, with solutes and solutions. Now, if I would like to calculate how many individual ions I have, I have moles of ions, we can multiply by Avogadro's number. I know there's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd ions for every one mole of ions. So that would tell me that this solution, this volume of this solution, would deliver 3.01 times 10 to the 22nd ions. So that makes sense. I have a very large number here because I'm multiplying by uh, Avogadro's number but realize it is less than one mole because I dealt with less than one mole of ions. So I have a number that's a little bit less than Avogadro's number. Okay, so let's consider preparing another solution. Let's say we would want to prepare a 250 milliliter volume of a 0 0.500 molar solution of sodium chloride. So we're dealing with sodium chloride again, but we're dealing with a lower molarity concentration, half of what we had before, and I don't need to prepare a full liter. I'm going to prepare a quarter of a liter. So I wouldn't pick the 1,000 milliliter volumetric flask. I'm going to pick the 250 milliliter volumetric flask this time to prepare it. Now, in order to prepare this solution, I'm going to recognize that my molarity is going to be my moles of solute per liter of solution. And if I want to determine how much sodium chloride to weigh out to prepare this solution, I realize I can convert my milliliters of my solution to liters. There's 1,000 milliliters per liter. If I multiply my liters of the solution by molarity, the liters will cancel, right? Because molarity is moles per liter. So I'm going to have liters cancel that give me the moles of solute. Okay, once I have my moles of solute, I could multiply by molar mass to get to grams of solute, which is what we're trying to do here. So first of all, let's calculate the moles of solute. So I take 250 milliliters, divide by 1,000 milliliters per liter, and then I multiply by my molar mass. So this is where I'm multiplying the liters of solution that I calculated here, which is going to be a quarter of a liter, times my molarity, which is 0 0.500 moles of sodium chloride for every one liter. So I'm getting that 0 0.5 from the 0 0.5 molarity that we were given here at the top. So I know that's how many moles I'd have if I had a whole full liter. Now I have less than a liter, so I'm only going to have a quarter of this amount in moles. right? So that gives me a value of 0 0.125 moles of sodium chloride in this quarter of a liter of a 0.5 molarity solution. Now I'm going to convert my moles to grams. So if I take the moles of a solute times the molar mass of whatever solute I have, that'll give me the grams of the solute. So I take 0.125 moles of sodium chloride, and we previously calculated the molar mass of sodium chloride as 58.44 grams. That's how many grams of sodium chloride for every one mole. So since I have a less than a mole, I'm going to get less than 58.44 grams. I calculate that it's going to be 7.31 grams of sodium chloride to, to deliver 0.125 moles. So I would go ahead in the lab, take the 250 milliliter volumetric flask, put 7.31 grams of sodium chloride in the flask, and then dilute with thorough mixing uh, until I have 250 milliliters of the solution by adding distilled water where the meniscus is at that etched line. 
Okay, so that's uh, the 7.31 grams of sodium chloride that I would put in a quarter of a liter of solution. Okay. Let's do one more calculation. Let's consider if I want to know what volume of a solution to prepare if I'm told uh, the solute concentration in molarity that I would like and a given number of grams of solute to begin with. So let's say we have a copper 2 chlorate solution that we're preparing. So my copper 2 chlorate uh, is used to prepare some fibers for dyeing. It helps the dye adhere to the fibers. Uh, but really I don't need to know that to solve this problem. What I do need to know is that we would like to prepare 0.225 molarity for our solution concentration. That tells me I would have 0.225 moles of solute. The solute is potassium 2 chlorate. That's how many moles of that solute I'd have if I prepared a 1 liter solution. Now however we're told that we would like to prepare this molarity solution starting with only 1.89 grams of copper 2 chlorate. Now you might recognize this is probably much less than the molar mass for potassium 2 chlorate so I'm going to be preparing much less than a liter of solution but I want to know just how much solvent uh, are we going to have what's going to be the final volume of the solution that we should prepare. Okay so here's my plan for the calculation. I'll take the grams of the solute that we were told, the 1.89 grams of copper 2 chlorate. I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to convert to moles of solute by dividing by molar mass. And then once I have the moles of the solute I can divide by molarity which is moles per liter to get the volume of the solution I should use in liters. Okay so the very first step here is I need to calculate uh, the molar mass of potassium 2 chlorate. So to calculate the molar mass of potassium 2 chlorate, I go ahead and look up, uh, sorry, copper 2 chlorate. I look up the molar mass for the copper uh, atom on the periodic table, the chlorine atoms and the oxygen atoms, multiplied by the number of atoms in the formula. Realize there's two chlorine atoms in the formula, six oxygen atoms. So we've done this before, so I won't spend much time here, but I calculate a molar mass of 230.45 grams per mole of copper 2 chlorate. Now, if I begin with the 1.89 grams of copper 2 chloride, I can calculate the number of moles by dividing by the molar mass we just determined. So I divide by molar mass, that'll give me the number of moles of copper 2 chloride, which is 0 0.00820 moles of copper 2 chloride. It's a very small value because I have much less than a mole with respect to the number of grams we're using for the solution. That also means that if I'm going to prepare a solution that is 0.225 molarity here, we're going to end up with having a very small volume of solvent is what I'm predicting. So I take the moles of the copper 2 chlorate and then I take my molarity of 0.225 molarity and I pull the units out and realize that's how many moles of solute per liter of solution. So I'm going to divide by the molarity. I'm dividing by 0 0.225 moles of copper 2 chlorate for every one liter of solution. The moles will cancel. I'll get to liters of solution. So I would have to prepare uh, 0 0.0365 liters or 36.5 milliliters of this solution. Okay, so we practice a few different types of calculations involving molarity. Uh, you might have to view these again and practice some homework problems to master this. I will be having a review test coming up here soon where you have to do these types of calculations, so make sure you're, you're practicing them. The next part of the tutorial, Solution Calculations Part 2, will deal with dilutions. Okay, have a great day, everybody.